bring that to a conclusion today. And we're going to talk about the word pillars. It appears in the book of Proverbs in connection with wisdom. And Proverbs itself is a book of wisdom. And if we spend time there, someone has suggested whatever the day is, like today is uh, September 24th, read chapter 24 of the Proverbs. You'll have 31 opportunities. Of course, in September, there's only 30 days, but take a chapter per day. And whatever the day is, read that chapter in Proverbs, and you will be wiser because of it. Uh, Proverbs talks about building our house with pillars of wisdom. No one is quite sure what the wise person was referring to when he said in chapter 9, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. Imagine this expansive kind of house. It's very nice and it's fit. I mean, when you think of pillars, you, you think of strength. But we're not sure what those seven pillars are that the wise person had in mind. The pillars are basically supports. They hold the building in place and they give it its strength. Well, it doesn't keep others from guessing what those pillars might be. Uh, you'll notice here that you have some proverbs from various places in the book, starting off with chapter three, the tree of life, the fear of the Lord, humility, counsel, and so forth. Um, that may be what the wise man had in mind. Some go to the first chapter, the first seven verses, and they find there seven pillars of wisdom. So that might be what the wise man had in mind. I'm going to go with what a number of others have gone with and go to one of the wisdom books in the New Testament. As it happens, when you read James chapter three, verses 13 through 18, he mentions there, seven things that have to do with wisdom. Uh, the verses are in particular uh, 17 and 18, but let's read starting with verse 13. You have it there on your outline on the opposite side of your order of worship. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you, James says. Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, this is the other kind of wisdom, the worldly wisdom, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. And then he begins to enumerate these seven characteristics or seven pillars of wisdom. He says, if you have these qualities, you'll be a wise individual. You'll be building your life with strength. And then he goes this way. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. There are seven qualities of the wise individual, and he begins with pure. Wisdom, first of all, is pure. Now, when we see that, we automatically, I think, think of moral purity, and I think that is true. But I think also, if you read James carefully, he has another kind of purity in mind, and that is purity of motive, single-mindedness. He really goes after the individual who's double-minded. And he says, when you pray to God and you ask God for wisdom, chapter one, you have to do it in faith because if you're not doing it in faith, you're double-minded, your motives aren't pure, you're praying one thing and expecting another. And so there needs to be this purity of motive, not double-mindedness, to where 
we're expecting God to answer prayer in accordance with his will, obviously, but because he wants to give us good gifts as well. James talks about the individual who has a mouth that it, on some occasions praises God. And out of that same mouth, what? He curses his brother. There's that impurity. There's that double-mindedness again. There's that not singleness of purpose. You can't love God whom you haven't seen and hate your brother whom you have seen. So wisdom, if you're wise, there is this purity of thought. There is this purity of single-mindedness. You're not double-minded. James says if you are double-minded, then you're unstable in all your ways. You're unstable in your prayer life. You're unstable in your relationships because this purity of heart isn't there. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? They will see God. When we purify our hearts and we have a single devotion to him and we have a single mindedness in our prayer life, we will see and experience God. But if God seems absent, we may need to begin with this purity of heart as James does. Secondly, he says, this wisdom from above is peaceable. If you look at your article on the inside of the bulletin, it says this peaceable wisdom is not seeking to be antagonistic, adversarial, or advantage taking. It promotes harmony, unity, oneness, and peace. In other words, you're not just looking out for yourself, you're looking out for all of us. When we tend to focus on ourselves and become selfish, then we have problems with the unity. There you have the discord that he mentions uh, later in chapter four. If we want the peace that he says here, and that's front and center for us, then we will be wise individuals, we'll be a wise congregation. Are you at peace with your family? Are you at peace with others in this church family? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And you'll notice as we go through this, some of these reflect the, the Beatitudes, do they not? Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons or the children of God. When we make peace, we're like God, because God is about the business of making peace. We serve the prince of peace. We put on our feet the gospel of peace. That's our message. Jesus said uh, you shouldn't break up a marriage except for marital unfaithfulness. Paul added one other thing to that list. And he said, if you have an unbelieving partner and that partner wants to depart, let that person depart because we've been called what? To peace. That's how important peace is. Peace in the family is paramount. And Paul said that is also an exception for breaking up a marriage. You never want to make that your goal, but you want to make peace. And if peace cannot exist within that marriage, then Paul says it may be better uh, that uh, you let the one go who wants to go. And probably he's talking about a situation there where both were unbelievers when they got married, and then one became a believer, and that was intolerable to the unbeliever. And he said, let that person go uh, for the sake of peace. When we are peacemakers, not just peacekeepers, but we're busy about making peace and trying to reconcile others to each other, as well as ourselves to them. We're more like God than in any, any other time, I believe. Number three, gentle. Uh, this wise individual is a gentle person. Jesus described himself as the one who is gentle and humble in heart. Come to me if you're weary. Have you ever noticed if, if someone isn't gentle but they have these rough edges and someone's having a difficult time, you don't go to that person. You go to the one who's gentle. You go to the one you think might understand you better. I like that poem. 
by Rudyard Kipling, perhaps his most famous poem called If. And it begins by saying, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming you. And then he goes on with some of the other ifs. The iffy situations in life, if this bad thing happens and you respond well to it and so forth. But his final line is, you'll be a man, my son. Then you'll be a man. Have you ever been in that situation where everybody around you was losing their head? They weren't thinking straight and they were blaming it on you. The natural tendency is join the party and lose your head too. But he says, no, if you can keep it, you'll be a man. You'll be a cut above. A gentle answer, Proverbs says, chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath. I've seen this have its effect where the argument starts and there's a little more gritting of teeth and a little louder voice, a little more anger, and all of this gets mixed in with that. And then someone responds gently and it starts to back down. It's true. A gentle answer turns away wrath. And we're wise when we have a gentleness about us. Power under control is what gentleness is all about. Number four, easy to be entreated. Again, in your bulletin, this means it is approachable. Are you approachable? If someone needed assistance, needed extra thoughts to think through a problem, would they approach you? Or would they automatically say, well, you know, no, no, he wouldn't understand, she wouldn't be sympathetic. Uh, a wise person is easy to be entreated, is approachable. It does not intimidate or give an austere appearance about itself. It is understanding and reasonable in its demeanor and attitude. Wise people are easy to be entreated. Abigail understood this. Back in the days when David wanted some payback from the protective treatment he had given to some of the uh, residents in the area where he and his band of merry men were uh, wandering, uh, he asked for a thank you offering from a fellow by the name of Nabal. And Nabal said, oh, no way. Uh, who is this guy? I don't owe him anything. And uh, David was a little bit miffed. He's been under my protection and I've done him good. And now he refuses to say thank you by giving us a little bit of benefit from his fields. I'm coming after you, guy. And he heads out that way. Abigail, who's a wise woman, understood this. And she intercepts David. Uh, and uh, she says, look, um, my husband lives up to his name or lives down to his name. Uh, his name, Nabal, means fool. Uh, and he is a fool. So let me help you. Let me give you a thanksgiving offering here. I've always wondered about that. Why would you name your child fool? I mean, from the get-go. I recognize some kids grew up to earn the title. But why shackle him with that name from the start? I mean, it's a blessed event and you're holding the child in your arms and someone says, what's his name? And you say, we've decided to call him our little fool, Nabal. Uh, well, maybe that's why he lived up to his name is because that's what the expectations were by some parents. Or maybe they were just in a raucous mood. I don't know. Uh, I've always wondered that. Uh, but Nabal wasn't easy to be treated because he wasn't wise. He was a fool. He was the opposite of a wise individual. Uh, you read in the bulletin there that uh, we had this wedding yesterday uh, for Caleb Jones and uh, Nicole Stevens. And uh, one of the exercises they did, they played a little game 
this was after the meal, and they got out in chairs that were back to back, and so they're facing in opposite directions where they can't see each other. But they take one shoe off their foot, and then they have one shoe from the other person. So if you're Caleb, you have one shoe that belongs to your new bride and one shoe that belongs to you. And she has the equivalent on her side. And then they go through a series of questions, and some of the questions are kind of funny, but there was almost like a, a personality test going on here. And you're trying to get an insight into who these people are just by the way they answer the questions. Um, and if you think the answer applies to you, you hold up your shoe. If you think it applies to the other person, you hold up their shoe. Uh, questions like, uh, who enjoys going shopping more? Well, you know, that's a no-brainer. That's her. Um, pardon? That was Caleb. Okay, all right. I just assumed it was her, but it, yeah, I'm not going to hold up my shoe. But, you know, at, how this goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they were answering these questions. And uh, one of them uh, was about who's the first to say I'm sorry. And I think they both held up. You have to help me here, <laughs> uh, Chloe. Uh, he held up her shoe, and, and she held up his shoe. And I thought, now that's a good sign. If she thinks he's the first to say, I'm sorry, and he thinks she's the first to say it. They answered several questions in my own thinking like that to where they were giving each other the benefit of the doubt. And that was telling me that they're going to be easy to entreat. They're going to be easy to get along with because they weren't answering the questions with, okay, that's a good quality, I'll hold up my shoe. Or that's a negative quality, it's your time. Um, I didn't see that. And just, well, they did their own vows too, their, their personal vows. And anytime, then that's rare that a couple wants to do that. But anytime they do say that, I just hold my breath. But I thought their personal vows were so good that I asked them for a copy of it. And I'm going to get that. Maybe I'll share that with you at some future point. Uh, but I think they're on their way to a good marriage based on this simple little test here that showed that they're approachable. They're both willing to listen and to be reasoned with or reasoned out of where they happen to be at, at the moment. Well, the next quality, number five, is full of mercy and good fruits. Jesus said the merciful, again, back to the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. But now just feeling merciful and feeling compassion for others is not enough, is it? That's why he attaches to it full of good fruits. If you feel compassion for somebody, are you going to follow through with a good action, a compassionate action? Uh, at our last ministerial association meeting, Pastor Stout from New Life Assembly um, brought to the floor a proposition that we as the association uh, put up a booth at the Exeter Fall Festival. And that particular Saturday is coming up October 14th. And what we decided to do is that vi different churches in town will have representatives there uh, to take contributions that people have if they want to do this compassionate giving to the folks who suffered from hurricanes or other natural disasters in the last few months. Think of Houston, think of Florida, perhaps Mexico will be involved in that as well. But there's a, an organization called Convoy of Hope. And uh, if we kind of rent uh, the truck and uh, uh, some of the uh, um, goodies that go along with it for $6,000, it'll uh, multiply out to about $50,000 worth of aid that'll be given to these folks who need it now. 
I'm bringing this up because I put a note in the bulletin. We are looking for volunteers who would like to take an hour or two or three or four hours, uh, whatever, uh, at the fall festival. If you'd like to man or woman this booth, uh, I'd like to hear from you. you know, we'll maybe put up a list by next Sunday. But uh, you can tell me verbally now if you'd like. But that's one of these ways in which we can show good fruits. Not only feel merciful, but come through with merciful actions or compassionate actions. Uh, blessed are the merciful. They will receive mercy. I like what Paul said about it in Romans chapter 12. He said, if your gift is doing acts of mercy, God gifts certain people with that gift to do acts of mercy. And he says the way to do it is cheerfully. Not everyone does their act of mercy with cheerfulness. I mean, they look like they're pained. They look like oh, they, they can't handle the situation or whatever. But if you're going to do acts of mercy, if you're going to help somebody, don't look like you're experiencing pain in your pocketbook or somewhere else. You do it with cheerfulness. And that makes the gift, I think, acceptable. Number six, if you're wise, you'll be without partiality. In chapter two, James gave a situation where he said, uh, here's a rich man that comes into the assembly and he gets all kinds of attention and special treatment. Uh, come on right on down front and uh, get a good seat. Uh, poor guy comes in, they say, hey, you know, take care of yourself, find a seat, sit down, don't be too obvious. And he says that kind of partiality is not the way God is. God doesn't show partiality. And we want to imitate God and be without partiality ourselves. Now this goes both ways because when you read the book of Proverbs, one of them talks about when you go to court and you have a poor guy here versus a rich guy, you don't automatically give it to the poor guy because you think, well, probably the rich guy is guilty. Uh, he says, no, injustice by any means is wrong. Uh, you listen to the case and you fairly and justly decide who is in the right and who's in the wrong. So without partiality. Number seven, without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. Uh, notice there, number seven, in your article in the bulletin, it does not preach a virtue and live opposite of that virtue. It backs up what it advocates by its actions. In chapter four, and let's read that text right now, drawing close to God. Notice what he calls these people. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Now, I don't think he means literally, but there's more than one way to kill somebody. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. And yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Do you know the most common reason for unanswered prayers? It is probably unuttered prayers. We don't have answers to prayers because we don't pray. It is probably what James is getting at here. In chapter 1, he says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. And this generous God will give the wisdom that you need. Now, the particular context he's talking about is you're going through difficulties, you're going through pain, and you don't understand why. That's the first question we always ask, isn't it? When we're going through difficulties, why me? He says, well, ask God, and he'll give wisdom. But there are other times when you want to ask God for wisdom, too. What would be the best step from where we are to where we want to be? Whether it's in personal development or church development, ask God for wisdom to give guidance. He says you don't have because you don't ask. And then when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure, you adulterers. Now here we're getting back to that double-mindedness, not that singleness of heart, not that purity of thought. They want to be friends with God, but they also want to be friends with the world. They want to love God and they want to love their own selfish 
pleasures. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. God wants us jealously to belong to him. He wants single-minded devotion to him rather than some devotion to him, spread them out, spread it out with other devotion to others or other things elsewhere. Well, he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, when we humble ourselves. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Notice that term humble that's being repeated here. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided. Now that wasn't accidental. I put the hyphen in there. I wanted to emphasize divided. So I divided the word. Your hearts are not single-minded. They're not pure. Your loyalties are divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Without hypocrisy, we are who we appear to be, is what James is saying. Well, you look at the bottom of uh, just below those scriptures, and you see we've given you two charts here to think about some of what uh, James has told us here about ambitious wisdom versus humble wisdom. On one side, you have wisdom that is earthly or devilish, Contrast that with the wisdom from above. You have wisdom that comes out of envy. This is the worldly wisdom or the selfish ambition that he talks about. We are wise in the ways of the world. We have street smarts. We know how to get ourselves ahead because we want that and we'll find out some way to take it. That's worldly wisdom. He says, don't go there. Instead, we have pure motives and we single-mindedly are devoted to God and to doing what is right. This is selfish ambition on one hand. On the other side of that is submissiveness, where you submit and put the other first. There's boasting here about who you are and what you've done and all of this. He says you're lying and you're not being honest with the truth. The opposite of that lying is the humility that he keeps coming back to. If you don't humble yourself, then God's not going to lift you up. There's denying the truth on one side. On the other side, there's the sincerity. There's the without hypocrisy. And then there's disorder. When you have worldly wisdom, when you have people looking out selfishly for their own ambitions, trying to get ahead with street smarts and worldly ways, you're going to have disorder. You're going to have combatants. You're going to have war. You're going to have fights. You're going to have people killing one another in one way or the other. And then he says, those are evil practices. On the other side, you have good fruit, the good fruit of righteousness. The peacemakers, he winds it up by saying, who sow peace, they're the wise ones. The peacemakers, they're sowing seeds of peace. They'll reap a harvest of righteousness in their own life. They'll reach, reap a harvest of righteousness in the lives of others. We want to be those kind of wise individuals. We want to have a life, a house built on something that's solid, don't we? And James lays down here seven pillars to build our life on. Go back through that. How are you doing for each one of them? In purity of thought, singleness of motive, being a peacemaker and peaceable, being gentle, being easy to be approached and entreated. Are you full of mercy with the good fruit that follows mercy? Are you living without partiality where you don't favor this one or that one, but all of them are God's creatures and you approach 
without partiality? What about hypocrisy? Are you who you seem to be? What about uh, being that peacemaker? Are you sowing the seeds of peace? You'll raise a harvest of righteousness. Begin where James begins. If you want to be wise, if you want to have these pillars, these areas of strength in your life that will hold up your life, hold up your personal house, your family house, start with prayer. Lord, I lack the wisdom to be who you want me to be. Show me how to become more like this wise person. If you need to respond, will you do that while we sing?